let me start with a terminological issue that was uh, introduced, I think, by uh, our distinguished moderator's uh, introductory comments. I view regime change in a more uh, neutral way than he does. And for me, regime change of the sort that occurred in Iraq or Afghanistan, which involves military intervention, is uh, what I would regard as regime change from above for, or from without. But there's another type of regime change, which is regime change from below. And, the, uh, and, and for, for instance, the, uh, the movement that uh, led to the initial upheavals that we at once called the Arab Spring, those were intending to challenge illegitimate governmental configurations, which are regimes. And that was, they achieved a certain kind of regime change. And that was a uh, benevolent uh, political development as it appeared at that time. So regime change from below uh, can be a very positive uh, development, and it's part of what uh, the logic of self-determination implies as the fundamental human right of peoples. Uh, whereas regime change from above and without is essentially a continuation of the colonial era under a new uh, nomenclature. And uh, it can be called, uh, for moralistic purposes, humanitarian intervention or counter-proliferation. A, a lot of the uh, justifications for uh, th that kind of uh, unpalatable regime change. And that unpalatable regime change in a post-colonial world rarely produces stability. In other words, it's dysfunctional from the perspective of the intervening side, which is something that I think is underappreciated. And because it's underappreciated, it keeps happening. The same mistake uh, and it's a fundamental mistake, is that one can transform the politics of a post-colonial society by this form, this traditional form of intervention uh, and uh, domination. It worked in the colonial era. It was quite efficient even in Latin America for the United States that didn't impose formal colonies, but so-called gunboat diplomacy, achieved a regime change at a very low cost in economically or in casualties. But it doesn't work in the post-colonial era. And what it tends to generate are forms of chaos, uh, the sort of sequel to regime change in Libya, Iraq, uh, even in Iraq with occupation. And Afghanistan is another example of this. And it, we see with uh, regret that the promise of the Arab Spring has turned to deep disappointment. And part of the disappointment is that when populations are faced with the uh, alternatives of order and stability or chaos, they tend to choose order and stability. And that's what happened in Egypt, essentially. Uh, and there's a saying that's very, uh, I think, captures this fundamental idea uh, in the Arab world, which is people prefer a hundred years of tyranny to a single year of chaos. See, and I, that expresses, I think, a very important dimension of uh, what, what are the true consequences and costs of 
military intervention in the 21st century. And that, that, those are, there are a lot of unappreciated lessons that arise there. And one of the uh, fundamental issues here is this tension in world order between two prevailing logics. The logic of sovereign states based on a notion of equality, that all states, large and small, are equal under law, and that international law provides the mediating um, normative framework for international politics. That, and the UN, to some, the UN Charter, to some extent, uh, epitomizes that uh, logic of equality. But there's a second logic, the logic of geopolitics, which is premised on inequality and uh, has prevailed as long as the state system has existed. We talk about the state system, but it's when we talk that way, we're only addressing the horizontal dimension of world politics. The vertical dimension, which involves the interventionary diplomacy of the uh, promi most prominent states and the imperial ambition of those states, uh, that's, uh, that eludes our political imagination when we talk about a world of sovereign states. It's not only a world of sovereign states, it's a world of sovereign states and a world of hegemonic states. And among the hegemonic states, especially since the end of the Cold War, the United States has emerged as a global state, one that uh, projects its power independent of uh, its territorial limitations, with navies in every ocean, with the airspace militarized, surveillance everywhere. It's, it's a global, non-territorial state trying to uh, impose a concept of order in the world. And so you have this uh, confusing, uh, not very often acknowledged tension. And that tension is embedded in the constitutional order. The UN, by giving the five victorious powers uh, in World War II the right of veto, in effect says, you don't have to act as equal among equals. You can decide when you don't want to obey international law or the will of the international community. You have the right of exception. And that right of exception creates a, a, a nihilistic situation from the perspective of international law. And it also makes the presence of double standards the real uh, uh, normative order that exists in the world. And you come to a situation such as exists in the Ukraine. Uh, where uh, regime change was provoked indirectly from without. Uh, and it was presented as if it was regime change from below. See, it was de a deliberate geopolitical ambiguity that was generated and creates a, uh, a kind of dual uh, set of responses. On the one side, there's the hypocritical pretension uh, that Russia is the intervening side that violates the norms of international law. On the other side is the geopolitical appreciation of the fact uh, that this was a deliberate provocation that has to be uh, joined with other provocations, such as the enlargement of NATO, the deployment of defensive missiles on the, uh, in the area surrounding Russia. In other words, a continuation uh, 
of the spirit of the Cold War in a period after the Cold War had ended. And the, there's another issue here that I won't try to go into but just mention, and it represents the persistence of militarism within the American governmental uh, structure, which needs an enemy that is not just terrorism. It needs a major state enemy in order to justify its continuing high military budget, which includes now a new appropriation of almost a trillion dollars uh, for modernizing uh, nuclear weapons. So that's, uh, in my view, quite uh, fundamental. In, the, in this uh, broader historical setting, where you have these two logics, the logic of self-determination, which brought colonialism to an end, is a transformative politics of the 20th century, and the geopolitical logic that is seeking to preserve for the West many of the material benefits of colonialism in the post-colonial world. And the Middle East is the crucible for this uh, uh, lethal interaction of these two logics. And there are uh, uh, obvious explanations of this, which again, I can't really elaborate on. Oil, the security of Israel, the avoidance of pr uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons to Islamic states, and the um, containment of political Islam. Those four uh, elements explain why this regime change from above was such a strong motivation. And if you look at the present problems, many of them emanate from the 2003 Iraqi uh, intervention. But as the theme of this whole forum about 100 years after 1914 uh, suggests, the real uh, uh, tinder for the uh, uh, fires that have afflicted this region was, were uh, created by the way in which uh, World War I was resolved. The Sykes-Picot Agreement creating artificial states, defeating the Wilsonian image of self-determination as the proper sequel to the Ottoman Empire. That, uh, that uh, dynamic of European colonial ambition uh, prevailing over this kind of partial Wilsonian uh, vision of a more just world order. It was only a partial vision because Wilson was only uncomfortable with Ottoman uh, empire. He wasn't uncomfortable with the idea of English and French empire, with European colonialism whereas Lenin was uncomfortable with both kinds of uh, empires. And there was a difference between Lenin's vision of self-determination and Wilson's vision of self-determination. But you had, in addition to that colonial legacy, you had the Balfour Declaration, which created in the British Foreign Office the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, which continues to be uh, a uh, deadly virus, not only for the peoples of Palestine, the indigenous population, but for the entire region. Uh, let me, I'm probably nearing my, uh, what? yeah, let me end by saying, uh, there, we have this um, logic of self-determination and a logic of geopolitics. But we now, in the 21st century, are confronted by issues that neither of these logics can address. And that, that can be suggested by the problems of how do we get rid of nuclear weapons and how do we address climate change. You cannot address, deal with either of these issues without a cosmopolitan logic that includes the human species 
a species logic, not a geopolitical logic, not a nationalist logic. And so without that kind of cosmopolitan framing of political community, I'm very pessimistic about the capacity of international institutions and international diplomacy to meet the challenges that the world confronts. Thank you very much. Thank you.